Thank you everyone for joining us today for safety and handling of permanganate with our presenter, Darren Scott. I'll be the moderator today, also with Karis, Ashley Swinkle. A few housekeeping items before we get started today. We are recording this meeting and everyone is kept in listen only mode. If you have questions, we encourage you to submit those throughout the presentation using the question pane in the GoToWebinar panel or email us directly. If you submit questions through GoToWebinar, we'll receive a report with the question and your contact information to follow up directly after the webinar. If you're interested in receiving a PDF or recording of the presentation, yeah, presentation. please contact, please us. contact us. We encourage you, we to, encourage share you to share within your network. Within your network. And then listed here are links you can visit for upcoming webinars and also our website. At this time, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our speaker, Darren Scott. Darren has worked for Keras for over 22 years with the last year in the Technical Solutions Group. He conducts laboratory testing and product demonstrations for Keras's municipal, industrial, and environmental customers and prospective new customers. These product demonstrations include technical training, safety pre presentations, and the installation of safe chemical handling and dosing systems. He is a graduate from Illinois Wesleyan University in Bloomington, Illinois, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry, ACS certified. Mr. Scott is a member of AWWA, WEF, and the American Chemical Society. And I will go ahead and hand it over to Darren. Thanks, Ashley. So today we're going to talk about safety and handling of permanganate products, but I want to start off with that Keras is a responsible care company. What that means is good chemistry at work. We want to have no accidents, no injuries, and no harm to the environment. We take that very seriously at Keras, so we have a secure facility with gates and key cards. We're very focused on reducing our emissions to the environment, our energy efficiency as well in our process. And that also translates to what we're doing today. So both employee, transportation, and process safety at our customer sites, uh, along with that product safety and communication uh, that we provide to you. If you ever have a, a question about the safety and handling of one of our permanganate products, please feel free to reach out to us. Keras Corporation is also responsible Keras certified. So today we're gonna talk about our permanganate products. There are two uh, forms that are available. There's the Perox potassium permanganate crystalline solid, which is greater than 95% active. It's what those two pictures look like, where it looks like purple sand, uh, and then a close-up where you can see it even more. And then the concentrated liquids are carousel products, which are both 20% and 40% active ingredients, uh, are the two grades that we sell them in. They look like a concentrated dark purple solution, Regardless of what form you buy, whether it's potassium permanganate in the Kerox form or carousel concentrated liquid, they're both gonna look purple in solution. Like I mentioned, one of the things that comes up sometimes is what available forms are the products in. So in the case of the 20% and 40% aqueous solutions, those are gonna be sodium permanganate based. One of the things about permanganate is Potassium permanganate has a very low solubility in water, so it can only be made to 5% solution at room temperature. In the case of sodium permanganate, that concentration in aqueous solution increases, and we can sell it at both a 20% grade and a 40% grade. Typically, potassium permanganate is always going to be purchased in the dry form uh, and then made into solution, and a typical solution there will be about 3%. Uh, because you don't want to get up to that max solubility of 5% because it'll take a lot of mixing and time to get it into solution. There are a couple things to keep in mind about the hazard potential of these products. Um, typically, uh, when we make them into solution, uh, KMNO4 solution, like I said, is about 3% active, sometimes 4 or 5%. Uh, so as far as the risk potential, it's pretty minimal in what it comes into contact with because the bulk of that concentration is gonna be water once you make it into solution. Now, when you're handling the dry product, if you were to mix the dry product, which is 95 to 98% active with some of these compounds, now you're mixing a dry component with another liquid thing, the hazard potential goes up. Uh, in the case of the 20% and 40% uh, concentrations, 
because of that higher concentration, it will react with some stuff that the 5% potassium permanganate solution does not. So there are some additional safety considerations that you would take with the 20 and 40% when you're handling it in the field. One of the things that I always feel that's important to, to talk about when we talk about handling of both potassium permanganate and sodium permanganate is material compatibility. So depending on how you're gonna store the product, uh, we ship it in containers that are compatible and we have many customers that feed it directly out of the shipping container. But a lot of our customers also get bulk or will transfer it from that shipping container into their day tank or their bulk tank and then use it from that point forward. And then obviously you have the plumbing from your application point back to your tank um, and any pumps you may use or equipment that you may use. There's material compatibility sheets available from Keras for both our Kerox uh, potassium permanganate and our Kerosol liquid permanganate. And that material compatibility information does change based on which product you're using. There's many more materials that are compatible with Kerox when you make it into solution at 5% to 3%, whereas when you're using the 20% or 40% concentrated Kerosol sodium permanganate, that does eliminate some materials that are no longer compatible with that type of product. Our guidelines are based on field experience for both of our products. Uh, and when you're selecting feed equipment, you can always ask for that material compatibility recommendation or uh, send us some information and we can review it with you to determine if that product's gonna be compatible. Our guidelines typically recommend materials that we come in contact with frequently or that we've seen customers use frequently. So you'll see recommendations for certain types of pumps and brands, and that's just based on us seeing them in the field used time and time again, and that we've got a good history that they're compatible. One of the things that we wanna point out is uh, workplace eye safety. One of the things is why take a chance when you're using a product that can be damaging to the eyes, so you want to protect your eyes. In the case of the dry potassium permanganate, it's a dust issue. So in that case, we typically would recommend goggles if you're handling a lot of the dry product or dumping it from a pail into a hopper because you can generate quite a bit of dust. Uh, and the idea is to prevent those airborne particles from going around your safety glasses and getting in your eye. In the case of liquids, it uh, depends on how much handling you do. You can obviously use safety glasses if there's not gonna be a lot of handling of the product, but if you're gonna be transferring, say a tote or a drum uh, by a transfer pump into a day tank, uh, there's a lot of transfer there. There's a good chance for splashing. So you might level up to goggles or you might level up to a face shield over the top of your safety glasses to prevent that splashing from getting around your safety glasses and your eyes. So one of the things you need to do at your site is how are you gonna be handling the product? What are you gonna be doing with it? and take that into consideration on what level of eye safety protection that you take. Another important part of handling permanganate is once you've transferred it out of the shipping container or used it out of the ship, shipping container, our containers are designed for a single use and they cannot be returned to us and they cannot be refilled. When a container has been emptied, there are companies that you can contact that will collect them and they will recycle the plastic or metal. In the case of permanganate, empty really does mean empty and triple rinsed with water. The recycling companies, disposable companies that you contact do not want residual permanganate left in the container. So what you'll do is pump off as much of the product you can and then rinse the container with water three times to rinse out the, the color, the, the excess permanganate. Um, typically you'll do that at your facility uh, and then you're going to want to collect the waste out of the tote, treat it to neutralize it, and, and then dispose of it. And then once that container is rinsed, you can then recycle it with one of those companies. In the case of handling uh, the dry product, uh, which has an issue with a dusting when you dump it from the pail all at once, you wanna make sure that you have a dust mask or a suitable particle mask that should be used. In our facility where we handle potassium permanganate on a daily basis, we have moved to N95 masks to protect against dust insulation. Obviously, uh, because of the pandemic, these inventories of N95 masks 
can be in short supply. So you wanna make sure you have enough to protect your workers when you're handling it. We do supplement our N95 masks with inventory of masks of higher efficiency um, for when you're handling that product. So a couple of things we wanna talk about with handling both the dry and the liquid permanganate products. Um, there is a hazard potential. Hazardous events can occur when the permanganate reacts unintentionally and rapidly with other reducing substances. And so we'll go through that uh, on the review of the SDSs. Permanganate is an oxidizer. So it'll end up, end up as the oxidation portion of it. And then with the reducing agent, you get the oxidation reduction pair. Also, hazardous events can occur when large amount of permanganates are released to the environment and get into a waterway. It does have an aquatic toxicity if you've had a spill and the, and the purple gets to a river or stream. In addition, there's also hazardous events that can occur when a worker is accidentally exposed to permanganate. Because permanganate in the dry form is abrasive, it looks like sand, uh, it can be corrosive and abrasive to the eyes if you were to get in you. Hence the reason why you would level up uh, to goggles so that you don't get it in your eye. Now, Keras takes a variety of ways to communicate with our customers. We have safety data sheets that are available both online or you can request them from your regional sales rep or from me in Technical Solutions. If you're in Europe, we have a chemical safety report that you can request from us. And then our lay package labels will have pictograms, and also when we deliver a product, there'll be warning placards on the truck that's transporting it to you as well. So those are all ways that we communicate with our customers. Specifically for Kerox potassium permanganate, it's considered a hazardous chemical. It has the pictogram for oxidizer, the flaming circle. So it is a strong oxidant. It can react violently with oxidizable materials that it comes in contact with. In the solid form, potassium permanganate is typically greater than 97% active. Now the product is stable under normal conditions. So if it's in a sealed container, you can store it indefinitely. A year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, in a sealed container, permanganate will still be 97% active. So it doesn't lose strength over time. If you're to open that container and expose it to the environment, one thing that will happen with permanganate is it will pick up moisture from the atmosphere and it will start to clump. The main grade that we sell is free flow grade, which adds a free flow additive that help prevent some of that when you're feeding it uh, with a standard feeder, but it won't completely eliminate that issue if you're to leave a container completely exposed to the environment for weeks at a time. One thing to keep in mind on the safety data sheet is the product is incompatible with acids, peroxides, combustible organics, metal powders, oils, and greases. Dry permanganate can react with those, and in the case of something like peroxide, it will generate heat. In the case of oil and grease, it can generate heat, which then can eventually catch fire. We do have compatible oils and greases that we use with permanganate, and you can request a list of those from us to make sure. But definitely in your storage area, you'd want to separate the dry permanganate from those products in separate containment areas. Once you take the potassium permanganate and dilute it down uh, in solution, uh, it becomes still stable uh, as long as you use finished drinking water for your, your concentrated solution makeup, but the hazard goes away. It's typically down, uh, like I said, 3% solution is what customers typically make. So it's much, much more safe at that lower concentration. One thing to keep in mind, please read and understand the safety data sheet and the product labels on the container before you handle that product to make sure you're wearing the proper PPE. In the case of liquid permanganate safety and handling, uh, we have the SDS available for that as well. And a lot of the information will be the same. It is a strong oxidant. It can react violently with oxidizable materials. Concentrated form, uh, typically 20%, 40% concentrations where most people handle. It is stable under normal conditions. So just like our potassium permanganate, uh, if it's in the sealed shipping container, uh, carousel and carousel see the 20% and 40% grades will stay at that 20 and 40% a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. It does not lose concentration over time. It has the same incompatibility with acids, 
peroxides, combustible organics, oils and greases. One additional safety consideration is because of the lower concentration with potassium permanganate, you can wipe up spills with a cloth rag or with paper toweling and then rinse that uh, paper toweling out or cloth rag out and nothing will happen. In the case of the concentrated sodium permanganate at 20 and 40%, if you were to wipe that up, you can possibly get that paper towel or that cloth rag to start to smoke and smolder initially, and it can eventually catch fire. So one of the things when you're cleaning up a spill of the concentrated 20% or 40% solution, you wanna dilute that down or wet the rag or paper toweling first with water, then wipe the spill out and then rinse the rag out uh, prior to disposing of it in the trash can. Permanganate's pretty apparent, so when you wipe up a spill, it'll be purple, and then when you rinse it in the sink, it'll go from purple to pink to then clear water. Once you see clear water coming out of that rag, there's no more permanganate left behind, and now you can dispose of it in the normal trash. So you do need to take that little extra bit of safety in handling with the 20% and 40% when you're wiping up a spill. Both Dry permanganate and liquid permanganate are considered oxidizing solids or liquids, depending on the version that you buy. And you can see the, the pictogram that will be on the SDS is the flaming circle. And they both fall under category two for those physical hazards. In addition to, to the pictogram and the SDS, uh, the permanganate label requirements include the name, address, and telephone number of Paris, the product identifier, the name we use for it. Then it also includes signal words, uh, in this case, for permanganate danger. It also includes hazard statements and precautionary statements that are directly taken from the SDS sections themselves. And then it contains supplementary information. And all that will be on the package label. One of the most important parts of handling permanganate is gonna be worker safety, and it's gonna be the pr proper PPE that you wear. Like I mentioned earlier, eye protection must be worn when you're handling either dry or liquid permanganate. The decomposition products are alkaline and may cause burns that result in eye damage. Also, it depends on how much handling you're using to determine whether you use safety glasses, goggles, or a face shield. Like I mentioned earlier, if you're just gonna be around the bulk tank and you're not transferring any of the liquid permanganate, then safety glasses would be sufficient. If you're gonna transfer large volumes, say from a tote, like 200 gallons to a day tank, because you have the chance for a splash hazard, you might level up to goggles or to a face shield uh, to prevent that. You also wanna make sure that you have an eye wash station nearby, whether it's a permanently in place eye wash station or the eye wash bottles that you can purchase and place in an area where you don't have access to water so that if permanganate were to get in your eye, you can rinse it out quickly with that saline solution. The next part of PPE would be trying to avoid skin contact with permanganate. Momentary contact with both dry or liquid permanganate can be irritating to the skin and definitely will eventually leave brown stains behind. You can actually damage the skin depending on how concentrated the solution is or what other compounds you may have on your hands as well. We recommend, in addition to normal work clothing covering the arms and legs, that you wear plastic gloves and a plastic apron if you're doing a lot of handling. Uh, you can also wear chemical resistant imperious gloves. Suitable gloves can be recommended by glove suppliers specifically for your handling and use. So it'll depend on how, how tough or strict, stiff a glove you need, depending on how much handling you're due. One of the things to keep in mind, like I said, why it would damage the skin is if you were working on a pump that had oil or grease on it that wasn't compatible with permanganate and then went and handled the permanganate and those two things came into contact on your skin, that will generate a heated reaction. So you wanna make sure that you wash your hands before you handle permanganate if you've been working on something else and had another chemical or something like oil and grease on your hands. It should be common sense, but you do not want to ingest both dry or liquid permanganate. So do not eat or drink permanganate or any other chemical that you have at your plant. You always wanna wash your hands before eating, drinking, or smoking after you've handled permanganate. 
if permanganate is swallowed, it can cause severe burns to the mouth, throat, esophagus, and stomach. If that permanganate uh, ingestion occurs, immediately rinse the mouth out and drink plenty of water. Never give anything by mouth to a victim who is unconscious or having convulsions. Do not induce vomiting. If vomiting occurs, keep head low so the stomach content doesn't get into the lungs. Get medical attention immediately. This is all in section four of the SDS. Storage requirements for permanganate. Like I mentioned earlier, it is stable under normal conditions. You want to keep it dry and away from heat. And that dry means in the sealed container so that the dry permanganate doesn't pick up moisture over time and get lumpy. You do not want to store it in your area next to acids, peroxides, combustible organics, organics such as brake fluid or antifreeze, metal powders, or other materials identified in the SDS. Your storage area for permanganate should be separated or separate containment from these materials so that in case there's a spill, they don't co-mingle in the containment area. You do want to take care to protect the containers from physical damage so you do not have a spill on the floor. One specific product that you want to avoid is permanganate can react with hydrochloric acid and you'll result in chlorine gas as a byproduct. So if you were to have those two things and they were to come in direct contact, you generate chlorine ga gas, which is toxic. So you'd want to avoid that situation. Refer to section seven of the SDS for these handling and storage information. In addition uh, to storage, uh, where you want to store it in your facility, there is a standard that applies to customers as well. The Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standard called CFATS is currently includes potassium permanganate on the chemicals of interest listed. If you are a drinking water or wastewater municipality, you are currently exempted from this standard. This only applies to industrial facilities or remediation customers and they're required to do a top screening for their security if they're storing more than 400 pounds at a time. Additional information on this standard can be found at the Department of Homeland Security CFAT standards website that you see listed below. But like I said earlier, this does not apply to municipal drinking water, wastewater facilities. It's for industrial customers and for remediation customers. One of the things to keep in mind as far as the chemistry of permanganate is permanganate will decompose upon reaching the temperatures listed below based on the equation below. In the case of crystal permanganate, if it gets warm enough, it'll start to give up oxygen once it reaches 150 degrees C or 302 degrees Fahrenheit. In the case of liquid permanganate, the decomposition starts at 275 degrees Fahrenheit or 135 degrees Celsius. What this means is if permanganate's involved in a fire, it will give off oxygen that will support the fire. One of the things that governs permanganate in the US is the National Fire Protection Association Hazard Code. This association has developed this communication diamond to provide valuable information to first responders and especially to firefighters if they're involved in a fire with permanganate. If the chemicals are involved in the fire, it signals how the products may react, what the effects of the byproduct formation are, and how the chemicals might react with water used to extinguish a fire. In the case of solid permanganate, the NFPA diamond is gonna be 301 with the special hazard being OX for oxidizer. What that means is the health hazard for permanganate is a three. Under fire conditions, it will give off irritating combustion products. The flammability hazard is zero. It's considered non-flammable. It will not burn, but it does support combustion by giving off that oxygen. The reactivity hazard is a one. It's considered normally stable. It's not reactive with water. It has to react with something else. So you can make it into solution and it will be stable, which is why it gets the one. And then, like I mentioned, the special hazard is OX for oxidizer. In the case of liquid permanganate, the same numbers hold true. 
It's once again, 301 and then OX for the special hazard. So once again, that health hazard is a three under fire conditions, it will give off irritating combustion products. The flammability hazard is a zero. It's non-flammable. It does not burn, but supports combustion by giving off oxygen. And the reactivity hazard is a one, normally stable, not reactive with water. And obviously in this case, we're a 20% or 40% aqueous solution. So we're storing it in water. And then the special hazard is OX. So in the case of a fire with permanganate for fire extinguishing, the best way to put out a fire is to use large quantities of water to extinguish the fire related to permanganate. That will cool the temperature so the permanganate no longer gives off oxygen, and then that is what puts out the fire as well and prevents permanganate providing oxygen to the fire. You do want a berm to contain the water. Obviously, as you're putting out a fire with permanganate, you'll generate a lot of purple, of purple solution with permanganate in it. And so you want to contain that so then you can neutralize it. You don't want to use dry chemical extinguishers such as CO2, halon, or foams for a large permanganate fire because those all operate by suppressing oxygen being in the fire. And in this case, if the permanganate's on fire, it's giving off its own oxygen. So it's providing the oxygen for the fire itself. You could use a CO2, halon, or foam uh, extinguisher if it's a trash can fire. So say you wiped up a spill with a paper rag or a cloth rag and threw it in a trash can, there's very little permanganate there in that case. And it's the other things that are combusting. So you could put those out with a CO2 or a foam extinguisher, um, but water will work just as well in that case as well. But it's just to keep in mind, large quantity fires of permanganate, you're gonna only wanna use water. A small trash can fire is something that you have other options for. Refer to section five of the SDS for this information. In the case of dry permanganate spill cleanup, crystalline uh, permanganate, you wanna clean it up immediately by sweeping or shoveling it uh, into a container. In the case of drinking water, you don't wanna return it to the original drum because it's now been on the floor, you don't know what other chemicals have come in contact with and you're gonna add it to drinking water. In the case of a wastewater plant or an industrial account, um, if there's no concern of it being uh, reacted or reacting with something that was on the floor that was incompatible, then you could uh, reuse that product in your process um, if you know what was on the floor, what, was, what it was with. If you don't know, you're gonna wanna transfer it to a clean metal drum and dispose of it according to approved local regulations. So just keep in mind what your application is, whether you're drinking water where you're gonna not be able to reuse it, or if it's an industrial or a wastewater application and you know what it's come in contact with, then you might be able to reuse it. In the case of liquid permanganate spill cleanup, you wanna contain and isolate the liquid. So collect it in a pit or holding area or berm it in place. In order to neutralize this product, you're gonna to wanna to dilute it with water until it's less than 6% solution and then you can neutralize it. In order to neutralize it, you can use a solution of sodium thiosulfate, sodium bisulfate, or a ferrous salt. You can refer to this in section 13 of the SDS. In the case of liquid permanganate, like I talked about earlier with the spill cleanup, you don't wanna wipe it up with paper toweling or with a cloth rag if it's concentrated at 20 or 40%. You're gonna to wanna to dilute it first. But for spills of 20 and 40% liquid, like underneath uh, a pump or underneath a container where you have a connection. We found that pig hazmat absorbent socks, spill tech absorbent pads, and United Zorbent's polypropylene, polypropylene absorbent pads will all soak up permanganate at 20 and 40% concentration and will not react. So they'll catch that solution on the pad itself or on that sock you can then rinse them out and reuse them time and time again without any concern for them to start to smoke and smolder or catch fire. Those same pads are also compatible with the weaker uh, three to 5% potassium permanganate. But in the case of 20 and 40, you wanna make sure you're using this type of material. One thing to keep in mind, you get permanganate on yourself, you have a spill of permanganate. Uh, water is your best solution. Put out the fire, rinse it off your hands, um, it's gonna give you a very telltale color 
permanganate while it's active will be purple to pink in color. And then once there's no active permanganate left, the water will look clear. You never want to neutralize a concentrated solution because you'll generate a lot of heat of reaction. So you always want to dilute the permanganate to less than 6% before attempting any type of chemical neutralization. So if you have a spill of 20 or 40, you're going to want to dilute it first and then neutralize it once it's below 6%. Keep in mind, in the case of that 20 and 40% solution, it can ignite cloth or paper or even wood. So you want to wash it immediately with water. Generally, we store the products on a concrete floor. As far as permanganate neutralization, the product can be neutralized multiple ways. For a larger spill, you can use sodium thiol sulfate or sodium bisulfite meta. Um, you can make those uh, up into solution from the dry product, or you can buy concentrated liquid versions of them. Uh, typically, what we'll do is we'll buy the dry and make it into solution in a, a standard weed sprayer that you see there in the picture. And then if you have a large spill, dilute it with water first to less than 6%, and then use that sprayer to spray down. What will happen is permanganate will be purple. As you spray the neutralizing solution on it, it'll go from purple to brown, which is manganese dioxide. And then as you continue to add more of the neutralization chemical, it'll go from brown to clear, where you'll solubilize all the manganese, and then you can rinse the floor off. In the case of uh, cleaning your hands, um, we have a milder cleaning solution that we use rather than the sodium bisulfite or the sodium uh, uh, thiosulfate. Some people uh, can be irritated by those solutions. Our cleaning solution that we use typically to clean our hands or small pieces of equipment is a makeup of water, white household vinegar that you can buy at the grocery store, and 3% hydrogen peroxide that you can buy at the grocery store. Roughly, the ratio we use is 30 parts water, 40 parts vinegar, and 30 parts 3% hydrogen peroxide. We do have customers that make it up one-third, one-third, one-third. And some customers, if they want to make the solution a little more concentrated, will make it 50% vinegar and 50% 3% peroxide. One thing to keep in mind, you don't want to use this cleaning solution on sensitive tissue. So if you were to get permanganate in your eyes, you rinse it with water and then consult a physician, you would not spray this cleaning solution on your eyes. You also don't want to spray it on mucous membranes, open wounds, or burn. Because of the vinegar and peroxide content, if you had a nick or a cut or a scrape on your hand, this will clean the wound, but you'll feel it because of the vinegar and peroxide concentration. The same thing holds true for using this as well. You do not want to add it directly to concentrated permanganate solutions. You always want to dilute the permanganate to less than 6% with water before using the stain solution. And typically what I would do in the field is I would completely rinse all the permanganate off of my clothes or off of my hands and then use the neutralizing solution on it once I've got rid of the excess permanganate. So when we transfer permanganate to you as our customer, uh, there is a hazardous materials regulation that applies to permanganate. In the United States, domestic shipments of hazardous commodities over the highway is governed by Title 49 Code of Federal Regulations for the Department of Transportation. What this sets up is it identifies and classifies what are hazardous materials. It establishes the quantity limitations that we can ship. It specifies the proper packaging that you can move the product in by shipping. It describes how we need to mark and label the package. It defines the shipping certificates that the truck driver needs to have. And it details how to placard the vehicle transporting the shipment to your site. So for the Department of Transportation, the proper shipping name is crystalline potassium permanganate. You'll see the oxidizer 5.1 placard on the truck that's transporting permanganate. The ID number for this product is UN 1490, so that'll be on the shipping paper. And the reportable quantity for potassium permanganate is 100 pounds uh, of a spill to the environment. In the case of liquid permanganate, it's listed as permanganates, inorganic, aqueous solutions. 
it will fall under UN number 3214. Currently, there is no reportable quantity established for liquid permanganate. The hazard class for these products are oxidizer, division 5.1, and packing group two. So why does permanganate count as a hazardous chemical? So the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, RECRA, of 1976 establishes four characteristics of hazardous waste. It can be ignitable, corrosivity, reactivity, or EPA, EP toxicity. It identifies oxidizers like permanganate as hazardous under the ignitable waste characteristic and specifically lists potassium permanganate by name. In addition, the Comprehensive Environment Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA of 1980, the Superfund site, is what also governs crystalline or liquid permanganate released to the environment must be reported if it exceeds the reportable quantity for that product. So in the case of a spill to the environment, dry crystalline permanganate has a reportable quantity of 100 pounds. What this means as a release to the environment. If you were to have a pail of permanganate on your site and you were to spill it before you got it into your dry feeder, as long as it's contained on your property and you can clean it up, it's not a reportable quantity. If that were to be released outside your fence line, and so you, you dump multiple pails and you were at 150 pounds outside your fence line and it released to the environment, now it's a reportable quantity and you have to report that release to the National Response Center at the 800 number listed. So just keep in mind if you have a spill and it's contained inside your property, inside your containment, and it's um, not over, uh, and it's uh, regardless of the quantity that you spill, if it's contained within your environment, that you don't have a reportable quantity. It has to be outside your fence line. So this would also apply if you're transporting the product and the truck had an accident and multiple containers were ruptured and over 100 pounds were released by the side of the road, that would also be a reportable quantity that you'd have to call for. So just keep that in mind when you do, when you do the re reporting for this. Like I mentioned uh, earlier, for both the dry and liquid permanganate, uh, it is considered an ignitable waste. So you're gonna have to dispose of uh, spilled permanganate through a disposal company that's licensed to dispose of oxidizers. Um, alternative uses, like I said, if you're an industrial plant or a wastewater plant and you're not concerned about what it possibly got in contact with on the floor, you might be able to reuse it in your process for odor control or a different type of application. In drinking water, that's not available because it no longer meets the NSF regulation once it hits the floor. Whether it's dry permanganate or liquid permanganate, the packaging must be triple rinsed to the absence of a pink color. You also must remove the label or mark the label out prior to proper recycling or disposal of that container. That information can be found on section 13 of the SDS. For a copy of the SDS, this presentation or other technical information, please contact your regional account manager, or you can request information via our website listed below. You can also reach us at the phone number 800-435-6856 for information. Additional contact information, you can reach out to me directly at either email or by phone in the technical solutions department, or you can reach out to someone in our EHSS department, Shelly Corbin, with her phone number and email address listed below. All right. All right. Thank you everyone thank for you joining everyone today. For joining and today. thank you, Darren, for your presentation. If anyone does have additional questions, feel free to reach out to either Darren or Shelly. The information is provided on the screen now. Thank you again and everyone have a great day.